All right, let's get started with the class. Today, our topic is going to be about RNA sequencing. I suspect that a lot of students coming to this course are just interested in this one feature. Um, so it's a very important topic for, for this class. Okay, so um, we know that uh, in our genome, for example, human or mouse genomes, most of the DNA are not really coding for genes only about 2% of the genome are really coding for genes. And if you look within a gene, uh, you see a promoter, which is before you know, the signals controlling how much this gene will be expressed and what condition it will be expressed. And then you will see exon, intron, exon, intron, and alternating, right? So um, every cell will have the same DNA in the body, but then during transcription, different cells will, will be activating a different set of genes. And the very uh, early is the primary transcri tr transcript, which includes both the exons and introns. And then after a splicing event, all the introns get spliced out, and then you will get the mRNA, mature transcript. And this mature transcript will get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and translation will happen to make proteins. And so the cell state is really determined by the collection of proteins in a, a cell. Unfortunately, so far, the proteomics type of experiment to look at all the proteins in the cell is, is available, but the technology is still under fast development. The much more mature form is to actually measure the gene expression of every cell in of, of the cells in a, a particular condition. So um, initially, when people were trying to look at the expression of genes, they do one gene at a time. When I started graduate school, gene expression became high throughput, where people measured the expression of hundreds and thousands of genes on a gene chip or microarray. But recently, uh, well, in the last 10 years now, people have been really moving towards measuring gene expression using RNA sequencing. And so this is a, a review paper where they roughly outlined the RNA sequencing protocol. And so if you look into a cell, there are DNA and RNA. If you can collect all the nucleotide um, and then uh, remove the contaminant DNA, use a kind of a DNA cutting enzyme to get rid of the DNA, you will have basically the mRNA. Depending on the gene length, mRNAs can be a few hundred base pair to a few kilo base long. And the very long ones, you can't really just directly put them on the current high throughput sequencing machine. And so um, there is usually a step to remove the very, very abundant uh, rRNA or tRNA. So only keep the mRNA. The mRNA has a poly A tail. So most of the RNA seq reactions use a poly A, which only select the mRNA and remove the really abundant housekeeping rRNAs. And, and then the RNA is still pretty long. We, we use a fragmentation to sometimes just add magnesium. You put them, you make them into shorter fragments of a few hundred base pair long. And then use a random primer to generate a cDNA. So these are now uh, a short RNA made now into, uh, into double-stranded DNA. And with the DNA in place, or these are cDNAs, you can adapt them to sequencing adapters, and then PCR amplify, and then sequence the end. Um, so this is the rough RNA sequencing protocol. And so you can see here, we are sequencing a tube of RNA from many, many genes at the same time. You just pour this cDNA you know, ends onto a sequencing flow cell, and you can read out millions of fragments at the same time. So um, RNA application is really wide. Basically, uh, the very simple approach is you want to ex examine the expression of all the genes in specific conditions. This could be developmental stage, you know, from early embryo to later uh, 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 embryo, or uh, hematopoietic differentiation. You can look at different tissues, you know, comparing what's the difference between a brain or heart or liver gene expression. We can also compare normal versus disease, for example, tumor versus normal tissues. Or um, you can treat either the tissue or the animal or a cell line with a particular drug and look at the control or, or drug treatment 
what are the genes that are expressed differently. So that's probably most of the application we're also gonna cover for this course. There are more advanced applications such as using RNA-seq to find the novel genes. There might be genes you don't know even existed there, but if you see them from the RNA-seq, then that's probably a new gene. People also use it to look at alternative splicing. So uh, this is going back to this uh, original um, slide here. R uh, remember for a gene, we might have multiple exon, intron, exon, intron um, alternating. Um, and so what we are showing you is just one way this gene can be made into a mRNA. Sometimes in specific cell conditions, the cell might choose to only uh, use a subset of these exons. For example, in some transcript, you might only have exon 1, 2, 4, but in other conditions, it might be exon 1, 2, 3, and no 4, and sometimes the gene might even start from a different exon. And so these are alternative splicing events. And so people are also using uh, RNA sequencing for alternative splicing. In the early days when people were using microarrays for splicing, the result wasn't so good. Whereas with RNA-seq, especially now, the RNA sequencing reads are getting longer and longer. You can directly read how an exon is connected to the next exon, and then you can really get a digital readout of how genes are spliced. Um, there are additional novel applications such as finding gene mutations. For example, if you have a tumor RNA and a normal RNA from the same patient or same yeah, individual, you could look at RNA and say, oh, in the normal, this location has one nucleotide or the, look at all the RNA reads line up in this location. You can see that in the normal, this region should have some nucleotide, but maybe in the tumor, there's a mutation happening you can directly see this mutation comparing the tumor with normal. There are also uh, people looking at the gene fusions. These can really be important driver genes for disease, especially cancer. Uh, the situation is like this. So normally in, uh, you, have, you might have gene A and gene B, they might even reside on different chromosomes. And because of some translocation and rearrangement, somehow, these two genes now are now fused into the same gene, and then they carry out a new function, which is causing the disease. And so this situation, you can really see from the RNA transcript because you might have a read that uh, really cross from one gene's exon to another gene's exon, and that's really good evidence that there is a gene fusion event. And so um, in this course, we will just cover most of the commonly used functions, such as examining gene expression. The nice thing about RNA-seq application is you do not need to know even the genome sequence as long as you know this is a organism that has used DNA or RNA, you can sequence it. It doesn't matter whether it's a new species or a new type of strain of a bacteria or a virus. You know, for example, recently there is the coronavirus. People can very quickly sequence out, I guess, both DNA and the RNA of, of the species. Um, Initially, you don't have to have genes predicted. Um, for most of this course, we're gonna look at known genes, you know, human genomes with predicted genes, but it's no longer a requirement. Whereas previously, um, last year when we were covering expression microarrays, you have to know the genome ahead of time and design specific probes to target the exons that you want to target before you can measure the expression of those genes. Whereas RNA is really agnostic to the genome or the species um, and or the genes. You can just sequence it out, look at the readout and decide. And it provides a very good digital representation. Whereas microarray give you analog readout of signal strength with uh, RNA-seq, every read you get is a copy of an RNA that's expressed in the cell. So um, it has much better accuracy and also very, very detection range. So for example, with microarray, when you have too much RNA or too little RNA, you may not be able to detect it. Uh, when you have too much, it might saturate. The signal is too bright on the chip. Whereas with sequencing, you can just, you know, every read is a read. If you, if you see that RNA, that gene is expressed. So um, it will give you a much better dynamic range uh, of detection. So um, with every type of high throughput sequencing um, applications, there are some quality controls that needs to be done. With RNA-seq, before 
you put this into a sequencing machine or made into a sequencing library, sometimes people want to also quality control their original sample. In this case, an um, RNA sample. This is not necessarily a case when you treat, uh, when you just isolate RNA from uh, a animal, like you kill a mouse, you take out the tissue, or you do experiment on a cell line. But um, if it's a, a RNA that, or, or tumor samples or tissue samples that you have stored for a while, um, or has already been made into a um, FAPE slide, this is a formaldehyde a slide for a formaldehyde fixed uh, um, slides, a par paraffin embedded slides, then the RNA will start to degrade. In fact, um, for example, if there is a surgical sample, uh, pe people take out a tissue or say tumor and put this on the uh, a, a, a plate and keep it there for several hours without processing, the RNA will start to degrade. And so knowing the RNA quality is very, very important. And RNA usually degrades from the uh, five prime end. So when you have a degraded RNA, you might still see RNA at the three prime end, but you will lose the, the, the beginning of the gene. And so um, a very important way to do RNA quality control is to, after you isolate the RNA, before making them into a library, run it on a, a machine to look at the distribution of the RNA. So you might see something really short that, that those doesn't really matter so much, but some of these fairly low ones could already be some RNA degradation. But the real transcript that we are very interested in for most of genes, they're probably more than 200 base pair long. And so looking at the overall distribution to look at how many of the uh, transcript are longer than 200 base pair, uh, this is called the DV200. For most of the fresh samples, you should have a DV200 of like 60, 70, or the higher, the better. You know, the, the, basically what percentage of the RNAs are pretty long. But if, when you are dealing with a archival tissue, you know, tissue slides, and you're trying to just extract a little bit of RNA from that slide, very often you will see that the RNA can be degraded and this short uh, peak, or this peak on the short fragments will be very, very high. And so with Illumina, the recommendation is if the RNA DV200 is less than 30%, you have to be careful whether to still prepare the library to, for, for sequencing. Um, so in terms of the experimental design, we mentioned ex a little bit, there are many different ways to do an RNA-seq. Um, uh, some people will do a ribo minus, which only remove the two abundant, especially rRNA transcript. You get, you know, most of the good ones. Um, but um, so sometimes, as you are, uh, the splicing is happening. Uh, the the you, um, so basically, if you do ribo minus, you will remove the rRNA, but you will have the pre mRNA for the, the regular genes. Whereas if you do a poly A, you have the, poly, so, so after the splicing, a poly A is added to the end of the transcript, you know you have a mature RNA, which might be in the process of being transported outside of the nucleus. And so there you would not have introns. Whereas ribo minus, you still have a lot of intron reads in, in the RNA. Uh, so poly A transcript, you remove the uh, RNA, you enrich for the exons, you get the mature RNA after splicing. Some people might even do a strand specific RNA. There's additional step. So um, you know uh, the, in the cDNA which strand is the original transcript direction. This is not necessarily as important for known, very well known genes because the direction of the transcription, you know, what that gene looks like, people know very, very well. But it could be useful if you're looking at a novel transcript, especially these uh, long non-coding RNAs where people didn't know there's a gene and now they see an RNA, they want to know is that gene coming from the plus strand of the DNA or the minus strand of the DNA? So maybe the directionality are more important. The most common type is this poly A type. Uh, they're very standard kits, you just use it to prepare. And um, uh, over the years, the cost of RNA sequencing has decreased dramatically. When uh, in 
I guess 2007, uh, 2007 is when high throughput sequencing really started. At that time when people were doing RNA-seq, it cost about two to three thousand dollars per experiment. And over the years, um, nowadays there are even uh, companies, you just send your RNA samples to them. They will make the library and they will do the sequencing. And the cost, I, I just recently see a, a sale, they say, oh, it's like $169 per sample. It's unbelievable. Because it used to be that even to get the expression of a single gene with qPCR is like $50. And now with the cost of three PCR, qPCR, you can get genome-wide gene expression. Uh, it's really quite amazing. However, uh, very often the experimental biologists, they, they say, oh, wow, we get a 169, we get an RNA-seq. Um, you have to understand what this means. For example, um, is the RNA coming back in a single end or paired end? Because remember the cDNA is kind of a fragment. You can either sequence from this end or the other end. And the cost usually for single end and, and paired end is proportional to the base pair you read out. And so in the old days when sequencing was really quite expensive, uh, people only do single end. They just read from one end. But recently, because you know, the sequencing machine, as we mentioned, like NovaSeq, is uh, so big that uh, uh, generating so much data, you can pull so many samples together. Very often now, people just do PE 150 default. All the samples together, all PE 150, and it might actually cost less. That would be really great because uh, you do get more data. And also for paired end, especially for RNA sequencing, you know, sometimes the two end can ma match each other and you can get actually a longer uh, transcript in there. Uh, sequencing depth is also important. Um, so basically, you can imagine in that one lane of sequencing, usually um, the cost of sequencing is how much does it cost by a lane or how, how much it costs by a, a whole flow cell. Usually flow cell has like eight different lanes in there. And so depending on how many samples they multiplex to put on the same lane. So sometimes in the, in the sequencing reaction, um, in this step, remember there is an adapter put into the, the cDNA but, or in, in this step. But sometimes you can do multiplexing, which means that, say, in a different tube of different RNA from a different sample, the adapter might differ at the end with a few bases so that you can separate, OK, this is one sample, that's another sample, that's another sample. And then at the end, you can pull them together and put them on a sequencing lane. And depending on whether you put eight samples or 50 samples in that one lane, you will get a different depth. And of course, the more read you get, the, the better. Um, and so this also depends on your specific application. If you only want to know a rough gene expression, usually 20 million read would be enough. But if you want to get novel genes, you want to get a splicing, you want to, or if you have a genome that has never been sequenced before, you might need to sequence this much, much deeper. Um, for example, in a recent uh, uh, National Cancer Institute project, most of the tumor samples are sequenced at about 50 million reads. And so depending on your application, obviously the deeper it is, the more expensive it is. Um, and the third is read length. As we mentioned, for every cycle, um, if you run this with your own local core facility, they also tell you a price. So you need to ask, if I spend this much money, how long is the read? Because if I only get third, in, in Illumina early days, we only read 20 base pair. 25, 35, then 50, 75, 100, and now 150. And so the longer the read, the more information you will get. And so uh, when somebody tells you the price of RNA-seq, you need to ask them these questions, right? Is it paired end? How deep you're gonna sequence? How long are the reads? And these are kind of useful information when you can compare different uh, facilities. In terms of the experimental design, with any experiment, we usually require some replicate experiment. This is just to make sure that if there are any technical biases or systematic biases, you are not being fooled by the bias and actually are getting at the real biological signals. Um, in the early days from microarrays, uh, because remember, uh, well, 
you probably didn't know, early days in microarray, the probes were spotted by PhD students by hand. And later on, they, they program a little robots to do this. But it's not a commercial production. Next time they, they use up these arrays, they spot new ones, it look quite different. And so sometimes uh, people need to have technical replicate, which basically is after you have already isolated the RNA, you just put them in multiple different library preparation and the uh, microarray were sequencing separately. This was done a lot with microarray days in the early days, but now with sequencing, people usually don't do it. With each RNA, you just need one library preparation, one sequencing. The agreement between technical replicate is quite good, uh, as long as you work with a reputable uh, core facility, because RNA library prep and sequencing are now mostly done with robots or sequencing facility or companies now. What's probably more useful are biological replicates. Uh, so there are also different levels of biological replicates. Um, one type is if you have cells grown in petri dishes, and the cell is really the same, you just grow them on different days and you isolate RNA, or you might be treating the, the cells with different drugs, and so you just process them on different days, you, and then get the RNA, you send them for sequencing. That's the very first level of biological noise. And it's mostly, you know, your ability to isolate RNA from that growing petri dish of cells. Um, and the second level of biological uh, replicates is a little higher. Usually these are lab animals. Say uh, you do some mouse experiment and most of the lab mice are genetically identical. If you use B6, you know, for this experiment, they are all genetically the same and we usually buy them from a place they're all six to eight week old. They have the same diet. They have very similar uh, lifestyle. Maybe they exercise or fight differently, but they are kind of similar. Uh, but then you, you will see usually the animal experiment will be more different from very well controlled the petri dish experiment. Mm -hmm. And the third level of biological replicate is uh, cells or tissues from human individuals or things you isolate directly from the wild, those can be much more different. You know, like individual, say cancer patients, there's gender different, they grow, the they geographical difference, age, uh, genetic different, racial difference, so many different things, right? So those, you probably need more replicates. And so how many replicates are good enough? You know, because it really factor into the cost of your experiment. Um, Single sample without a replicate is only good for exploratory assays. It's not really good enough for publication. Sometimes you just say, oh, I have 50 drugs. I want to treat the cell. I want to see what the cell would respond. You know, maybe you get just one, each drug you treat one cell and you look at all the gene expression ones and you decide out of the 50 drugs, maybe I'll focus on these five. And then you do more replicates on those five. Those are okay. Um, if you do cell line experiments, usually in a publication, you have two replicates, you will be okay. Three is, I mean, basically more is al always preferred, but, you know, two reviewer will probably let you go by. If you do animal experiments, three would be preferred, but if you have human samples, like clinical trial, you would need a lot more. Tumor samples usually, for example, for a uh, TCGA project where they look at uh, all the breast tumors or all the lung cancers, each tumor type, they have hundreds of patients because there are all other variabilities that you have to control. Um, so replicates are definitely important. And, and also, uh, it's important to really make sure that you have a good experimental design. For example, if you are going to generate rep replicate, make sure that the treatment in each uh, replicate, you have a treatment and you have a control, and they're always together. Uh, don't do an experiment like this. Uh, so one day I do the control, right? I isolate three, two, like a TB tree dish of RNA, and I treat the cell with some drug, and three days later, all I have is the treated cell. Then what you might see difference might be what we call batch effect, is because what the reagent or whatever, your hands on one day versus another day, and you only get this type of artifact and not a real um, biological signals, okay? So uh, questions about RNA-seq in general. Very clear. 